All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Arthur Brakeman. I'm going to do a short presentation about Tezos. Uh, but before that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the conundrum when uh, I do a Tezos presentation in those meetups because uh, in the audience uh, tonight, there's going to be someone who's been following Tezos since maybe 2014, knowing that they're about the project, and, bore that, and I'm going to bore that person to death. And there's going to be someone who knows nothing about Tezos, and if I start talking about some marking details about Tezos, they're just going to say, well, what is Tezos anyway? Uh, and there are people who are very technical, who program a lot of smart contracts, and they'd be very interested in hearing details about smart contract programming in Tezos, and there are people uh, who don't. And so it's, it's always hard to try to tailor a presentation. I also try to not give all the same presentation every time. And so this is a, uh, you know, this is a compromise <laughs> in, uh, in what I'm going to present. It's a general presentation of Tezos, brief presentation of Tezos, followed by a bit of a discussion of the smart contract model in, um, in, uh, in Tezos, uh, <laughs> notably Mikkelsen, the calling conventions, which should be a nice segue into the discussion of um, LIGO. Uh, but again, so since I don't know uh, exactly who is in the audience, who's interested in what, I'd like to uh, leave a lot of time for Q&A. And by that, I mean make the bulk of the presentation uh, a Q&A. All right, so without further ado, uh, let's start with uh, what is Tezos? And uh, I've had the different definitions over time. This is the most pedantic one that I'm going to give you. Uh, Tezos is a technology, you know, it's not a, uh, it's not a blockchain, it's not a cryptocurrency, it's a, techno it's a technology. Now, that technology, it doesn't just exist in the abstract or as an idea, it is implemented in a software project. So there are um, code repositories, ooh, there's ambience now, can you still see me? So it is implemented as a software project, so you will... Uh, you know, you can, uh, there are several uh, Git repos online where you can find software which implements that technology. Now, what can you do with that software? Well, you can run that software on your machine, and if you do that, you will participate in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So you will communicate with other people running your Tezos node. And what are you going to communicate about? Well, you're going to communicate about blocks and operations that together form a blockchain. Now, if you say, well, Tezos is a blockchain, <coughs> I won't hold it against you, it's a very nice shortcut, but if you want to be extremely rigorous about it, it's a technology and you, know, you get to uh, build a blockchain. What does a blockchain do? What do you need a blockchain for? Well, you use a blockchain to maintain a decentralized ledger. And what is this uh, ledger used for? To instantiate a cryptocurrency, because at the end of the day, if you look at a cryptocurrency, it's not a, uh, it's not a claim on an asset, it's not a claim on anything, it's just a, a digital asset that exists by itself, that exists by virtue of a ledger uh, being maintained. So that's kind of the rigorous uh, lay of the land of uh, what Tezos is. And so, you know, sometimes I will hear, uh, hey, can Tezos do this? And I'm like, no, Tezos is a technology, it's a piece of code. Anyways, so that's what, uh, that's, what's, that's what Tezos is. And you're like, fine, okay, I get it. I know what a blockchain is, I know what a cryptocurrency is. What's special about Tezos? What's, you know, why do I care? what's different about it. And so the main thing, I would say the most important thing that's different about Tezos is that it has this ability to self-amend. And what I mean by that is they are, you can, you can think of a, um, of a blockchain as instantiating rules. So in every block you have operations, <coughs> such as transactions, for example, and what these, what these transactions do is that they operate on a state. They operate on these ledgers. They modify these ledgers. And you have rules defining which operations are valid and which are not. And so one valid operation would be to uh, spend some coins for which you hold a private key. You can have coins which, are, uh, which will be um, uh, protected by a, a public key. And using the private key, you can sign a transaction and spend them. So, a transaction where you hold a private key, that's a valid transaction. But if I don't have the signature, that's an invalid transaction. So you have a set of rules that define what can happen. And of course, something like a transaction, well, that's very basic, but you have a lot more rules than that. Uh, you have rules about how to get consensus in the network. You have rules about what kind of transactions you can do. Can you do more advanced type of transactions? Can you use scripts? Can you use smart contracts? So all of that, those are rules of the ledger. And what's special about Tezos is that um, 
beyond the rules for describing what happens. So in the jargon of Tezos, we uh, refer to that as the economic protocol. Beyond that, you have meta rules. And those meta rules tell you how you can modify the existing rules, how you can modify it. And now, why, why might you want to modify them? Um, well, uh, innovation. So let's say you have a smarter way of doing a transaction. You know, you might want to say, well, you know, we have different ways of doing a transaction now, and that's, that's a rule change. How do you do this rule change? You have a meta rule. <coughs> And uh, of course, to be fully circular, the meta rule can also amend itself. So you can have a meta rule that describes the conditions under which uh, you might change the rules and the conditions under which you can change the meta rules. So that's very abstract. I'm going to be very concrete. What this means in the present day is that you have a voting system on Tezos. And this voting system lets anyone, anyone in the world, can come in, they can propose a rule change to Tezos, and that's submitted to a vote for the coin holders. And so the coin holders, in proportion to the coins they have, and through a mechanism of delegation, can um, decide if they want to adopt this role chain or not. So that's the meta rule. The meta rule is basically counts the votes, and if you have a supermajority of 80%, and there's a, there's a few detail, it's, it's, it's not just that, but that's basically it. If you have a big supermajority, if most people want the chain, <coughs> make the change happen. Now that rule could change. You could go and have and propose that we do away with the votes. If you want to, if you want to say self-amendment is a silly idea, let's get rid of it. Uh, you could make a proposal to destroy the meta rules, have no meta rules, or you could say uh, have something different than voting. You could have prediction markets. Um, you could have representatives. You can have many. There's many many governance model. You can you can vote as part of the meta rule. So the system is very very generic. And I say to people, if you don't like self-amendments, well, you should you know, just self-amend in a way where you don't have it anymore. Uh, now, you could, if you, contra you can contrast self-amendment with what exists nowadays uh, in the landscape of blockchains and uh, you know, uh, public blockchains, distributed ledgers. There's basically two views that dominate. One, which I will call for this purpose, immutabilism. So the idea here is never change any rule. The rule, they're set in stone forever. Now, that's great in theory. Um, it might sound, you know, I, I don't want to sound disparaging here. Uh, it can be pretty great in theory because it's nice to have a rock solid foundation. It's nice to know the rules are not going to change, especially for something that you might want to use as money. You want, you, you know, you want to know how it's going to work. You want to know it's not going to change on your feet, that you're not going to make, you know, you, you might plan for the future. Maybe I'm going to plan to use this a certain way 10 years from now. And if I don't know how it's going to behave, then, you know, when do I know? And also, if the rules can change, then maybe they can be captured by special interests. You could have special interests that try and change the rules in a way that benefits them and harm you. So, a lot of sympathy for that view. The problem, the problem with it is that it makes it extremely hard to innovate and introduce new features. Once you start having very, very strong social norms about never changing your rules, you miss out on a lot of really good stuff. You miss out on smart contracts. You miss out on the ability to, um, for transactions to preserve your privacy. You miss out on a lot of uh, opportunity to have faster consensus. So you miss out on a lot of opportunity in this space. And this is typically, you know, this is a debate you'll see between people who are really much into Bitcoin and people who uh, prefer other um, cryptocurrencies and other technologies. Uh, oftentimes, uh, what I find a little, th there are very few, there are very few Bitcoin people who will admit that there's a trade-off. They will say, no, no, no. Not only can we not change the rules, but on top of that, we have the best rules anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it, and and that's suspicious, you know. If someone tells me, you know what, it's too bad that Bitcoin was not, you know, it's too bad that when Bitcoin was created, we didn't, you know, Satoshi didn't think, or or, or, or like worse it to include smart contracts or what have you. But that's the way it is, and and, and we're better off keeping this than trying to change things. I would have more respect for that than the position is like, no, actually we are optimal in, you know, we're optimal in these two uh, unrelated dimensions. So the other approach to that is fork-based governance. So fork-based governance, you say, we're going to change the rules and what we'll do is, we're not going to have a formal process, but what we're going to say is like, hey everyone, let's all change the rules. You know, like I said, it's a peer-to-peer -peer network, so if everyone starts running a different network, if everyone starts saying, okay, we're not going to pay attention to this old thing, we're going to pay attention to this new version, uh, which has new rules, 
then you can innovate. You can you can introduce rule changes. Uh, now that's good, but it's it's weird because there's not a really good process for defining how that happens. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about how well fork-based governance works. And I think part of the reason is because fork-based governance has a pretty successful his, uh, history in the open source world. So in the open source world, when you, know, you have a piece of software that everyone can copy and everyone can make it their own and have their own version, the nice thing about that is if developers disagree on what to do with it, then they can fork it. Uh, so for example, if you have, let's see, uh, that's an old, I need to have a newer example, but if you had X386 as a display manager on Linux, and then you, you, know, you disagree on uh, how they're going to license it or how they're going to, certain features, you have XORG. So you have a fork, different, uh, different uh, version of it. And you know, uh, you know, Linux has had forks, there's, there's forks of almost every, uh, every open source project, which lets different people have different version. And that works fairly well in the sense that people can develop these things in parallel. There's no conflict here. And maybe one version will end up having more users. It doesn't, and I think one of the main thesis, thesis for Tezos is that that approach does not really work well for something like a cryptocurrency because cryptocurrencies are fundamentally about network effect. So fundamentally, a cryptocurrency is not a claim on anything. It's not you know, it, it, it's not like you'd say, oh, with this cryptocurrency, I get a right to something. You know, I get this right to something that exists in the real world. You know, I get a right to, um, you know, like to a piece of a, to a piece of a mine or uh, to some assets. It's purely, you know, it is purely valuable because people ascribe value to it. Um, and if you have a fork, well, then you, do, you can't just duplicate the value. So essentially the value is going to kind of like distribute itself between the two forks. And if you think of the mechanism by which that's going to happen, that's really a, um, it's a mechanism that rewards very, very um, herd-like behavior. In a sense that you want to make the same decision as everyone else. You don't want to be the one left out for the herd because if, you, you know, if there's a fork between version A and version B, and then you'll say, well, I'm a merchant and I'm going to accept version B, you know, and, and, then, and then everyone moves over to version A, and all of a sudden, you know, your version B, you're the only one using it, it becomes worthless. <coughs> so you sh it, it doesn't end up being about what you prefer as a user, which might be the case if you're using you know, a window manager, if you're using a web browser, if you're using many software, it's roughly compatible, you don't care what other people use. Whereas for a cryptocurrency, you almost primarily care about what other people use. And so the change you know, in fork-based governance, what, it, what end up determining the winning fork is really based on social dynamics, it's based on perceived legitimacy, it's based on a lot of factors which don't have a whole lot to do with merits or what people might actually want. You know, the naive view is to think, well, 80% wants version A and 20% wants version B, and therefore version A is gonna win. That's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. Because people don't go for the version that they want, they go for the version that they agree everyone's gonna converge upon. The shelling point. And there's many, many different uh, things that, that affect this shelling point. And oftentimes, I think it's concentrated around core development teams. And so I think, it's, I think it disenfranchises uh, a lot of developers, potentially, and it's a source of centralization. So what we do in, uh, in Cytezos is to say, instead of having immutabilism, where we're never going to change anything, instead of just having this ad hoc process where everyone will just agree to change the rules at the same time, Let's have a formal process. Let's have an on-chain process. We have a blockchain. We have a consensus-making tool. Let's use our consensus-making tool for making a clean consensus about what the change uh, ought to be. And then enact this change automatically. It's, you know, it's binding. It works like a smart contract. So there's already been a, a protocol change on the Tezos chain, uh, nicknamed Athens. So Athens was a proposal that was made in February. And after three months of voting, uh, three rounds of voting, Athens was activated. And what that meant is that you know, the minute so the minute the last voting period ended, <coughs> the chain by itself computed the amount of votes. It says, "Yep, there's enough votes," and it took a piece of code and it patched itself on the fly. No need to restart your node uh, or any of that, and the node had a new version. And there's currently a voting process for another proposal called Babylon. You guessed it; the themes are cities and uh, A, B, C, D, and so on and so forth. And Babylon is a collective work of uh, several. Uh, uh, of several teams and, uh, and open source developers, so it's, uh, 
it's a it's a pretty big uh, it's a pretty big proposal, and I'll talk about it a little bit. So what else is different about Tezos? I, I say sometimes that there are kind of three legs to Tezos, and people come to Tezos and they're interested in one of the different legs. So some, for me, I think the most important one because it's the most defining one is the self-amendment. But there's two other ones which are pretty interesting. One is proof of stake. So as you may know, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum uses a proof of work uh, mechanism for consensus. That means that they rely on mining. You expand computing energy to show that you've consumed real world resources and that gives you the right to participate in a consensus group. That's proof of work. Proof of stake is the idea that you're able to do consensus instead um, by using your own cryptocurrency as a CBL control mechanism. The idea is that the people who can participate in consensus are the people who hold the cryptocurrency as opposed to the one expanding um, efforts on the outside. And the main benefit of using proof of stake is that A, um, you don't need as much inflation because you don't need to destroy real world resources to do this and so in, in, in some sense it is a much uh, cheaper mechanism. You can have much lower inflation. It's really funny because if you, if you want to troll really hardcore Bitcoin maximalists who say like Bitcoin is about sound money, you will say, well, actually, you know, if you want to make Bitcoin work, you need a block reward. Uh, there's a lot of like Bitcoin core developers that agree on that. There's academic papers about that. It's pretty clear you need a block reward. And if you keep having a block reward at infinitum, you're going to have inflation. So the least inflationary cryptocurrency you can build is, pre is proof of stake. So if you're really all about sound money, you should defend proof of stake. You know, tell people like, I prefer proof of stake because uh, you know I like sound money. Just <laughs> close their mind. Uh, and uh, you know, it's you know, now proof of stake has its own uh, has its own quirks. It's not without its downsides. Uh, the fact that it's not grounded in the external world means that you can't have exactly the same guarantee as proof of work. Like one of the guarantees you can't have is this called this long range attacks, where somehow you connect to the network for the first time and you don't trust anyone in the world to tell you where the network is and someone shows you a fake version of the network that they constructed and you're like, I don't know, which one should I pick? You know, should I pick the one that's <coughs> widely adopted by all these merchants that they see out there or should I pick this one that some random IP on the internet gave me? And if you think that's a big problem, then sure, proof of work is very important. If you think that doesn't really matter, then sure, you're losing one property, but it's not a very important one. Um, the other one that you're losing with, uh, with proof of stake is that, uh, in some sense, everything that happens is on the everything that happens is kind of self-contained. It's on the platform, and so you cannot have um, this this free entry that you might have with uh, uh, with mining. So in mining, in theory, you can just come in with your miner and start adding blocks. Uh, and if the miners are trying to censor you, maybe you can just like bribe one of the miners to get your your block in. So there's some arguments with that. In proof of stake, in theory, it might be easier for cartels to form. I'm not quite convinced about these arguments. I think it's possible to form cartels in proof of work as well. I think bribing attacks in proof of work or proof of stake for forming cartels uh, are basically, like, from a pure game theoretical point of view, are um, are possible. <coughs> I think there's a lot more to the story than this, which is why we actually haven't really seen it in proof of stake and we haven't really seen it in proof of work. But overall, there are trade-offs. I think the trade-offs are in favor of uh, proof of stake. And one of the nice things about Tezos is that from day one, it launched with proof of stake. You know, you'll sometimes hear like, Ethereum is a proof of stake cryptocurrency because they've been talking about it for so long, but it's still proof of work. So it's proof of stake. It's a simple proof of stake mechanism. There are a lot of very fancy uh, proof of stake methods which are being proposed now. So there's kind of this like explosion of academic papers on proof of stake. It's great. But Tezos is, you know, design of Tezos is from 2014 where proof of stake was still a little fringe. So it's a very simple chain-based mechanism. It works, it's fine, it, 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 it works great. It doesn't have all the fancy, very fast finality and all of the other aspects that uh, are being brought by papers now. Uh, but it is one of the first, I think the first uh, proof of stake chain to launch with the uh, with a slashing ability, which is to say that if people equivocate on the chain, if you're a, like uh, a block producer and you produce two blocks at the same height, you actually lose some money. And that's one of the big advantages of proof of stake is that you can you can put uh, you can put large amounts of stake. There's no stake in um, in proof of work. The only stake you have in proof of work is basically what you're spending in uh, in electricity. <coughs> so anything that's at stake in proof of work has to be inflation. Whereas here you can have an amount that's at stake that's not inflation. So the symmetry is uh, is much better. Um, and yeah, the nice thing also is that it's evolving. So even though it's not like the newest proof of stake algorithm. 
it's, uh, there's already a new version of the proof of stake algorithm that uh, has much faster convergence that's being proposed in Babylon. So the old one was called EMI, the new one is called EMI+. Uh, and there's also working prototypes for uh, using uh, Tendermint with a random quorum on every block. So many options, it's just uh, going conservatively <coughs> towards from something that works to something that's you know, better, on, uh, better on paper but needs to be tested. Um, and then the other leg is uh, the smart contract languages. So instead of having a very low level assembly-like smart contract uh, uh, VM for Tezos, like the EVM, for example, or all these chains which are trying to um, use a web assembly, uh, in Tezos it takes a very different view and it uses a high level, statically typed, purely functional virtual machine, uh, which is called Megasyn. And so Mikkelsen is a little bit uh, weird and hybrid. It's a low, I call it a low level, high level language. It's low level because it's stack based, it doesn't have variables, it, you know, it does some like basic data manipulation, but we'll see that it's also high level because it has a lot of high level constructs. Uh, one of the benefits of doing that is that you can actually audit the contracts on chain. Now in theory, you know, I can go on, in, on the Ethereum blockchain and I can, edit, I can audit the contract. So I'll grab the EVM code, okay, I can't, really, I can't really take the EVM code and understand what the contract is doing. So maybe I'll find the Solidity sources. Then I need to trust that the compiler, actually, that the semantic of the Solidity sources are correctly replicated by the compiler into the EVM code. But I, I don't know that because it's not a certified compiler and it's not trivial to build a certified compiler. Whereas in Mikasen, you can actually directly work with the, the source code and the source code is going to be high level enough that you can understand uh, the properties of your contract. So if you care about, if you care a great deal about um, the safety of smart contracts, assurance, understanding what the smart contract does, I think it's a really nice, it's a really nice property to have. And we've seen, you know, high, high profile projects lose a lot of money through smart contracts bug uh, in Ethereum. And so I think that was a, that's a wise choice. Um, and you know, the other nice property is that it's easier to make formal proofs about these contracts because it's a, uh, it's a constrained language, it, it's typed, it's purely functional. And so as a result, there are several contracts in the Tezos ecosystem, like for example, the multi-IC contract, which come with formal proofs of correctness, which is a nice thing to have. So a little bit about what the smart contracts are in Tezos. So a smart contract is uh, it's basically an account which potentially hold, hold some TES, the native cryptocurrency. Now it might, it might hold zero, you know, zero is a valid amount, but it can hold some TES. Um, and it has an attached storage. So storage is a piece of data and will have a specific type. Storage is not just a blob of bytes. It's gonna be something like an integer or a date or a date and an integer. Uh, it has an attached parameter typed Type. So it's the parameter that's expected by the contract. The contract expects you to send a message when you call the contract. And that message has a type. And it has an attached script. And so the script is also typed. The script is, uh, of course, typed by um, the parameter and the storage. Why is that? Because when you call the script, it will start on its stack <coughs> with a storage and a parameter. And at the end of the script, uh, you're supposed to end with an empty stack containing only the new value of the storage. So it's basically purely functional in the sense that you start with the storage and then you produce a new value of the storage. There's no mutation of the storage happening. Uh, one of the nice things about that is you avoid a lot, of, um, you avoid a lot, a lot of, uh, of pitfalls. There's no, I'm modifying my storage one way and then I'm doing something, then I'm modifying it the other way. You take your storage, you modify it, you produce it, and you're done. And of course, you also produce a list of operations. And so by operation here, I mean essentially calls to other uh, contract, messages to other contracts. So you execute your whole thing, and then at the very end, the last thing you do is say, and by the way, these are the messages that I want to send to all of these other contracts. I'll talk a little bit about the calling convention in a minute. Just a little more about Mikkelsen. So it's a statically typed language. It's a stack language, there's no variables, but you have annotations. So annotations is a, uh, a nice way for the editor to display to you what the content of the stack is. So if I push a variable in this, if I push a value on the stack, I can call it, I can call that value uh, amount or amount paid or uh, signature received by the contract. <laughs> I can give it a name. And then when I modify my stack, 
I can see the name in the stack. So instead of just saying like, oh, you have an integer there in your stack, I will see like, okay, this is this value. And in practice, that gives you the same amount of, uh, of readability as you would get from, uh, from variables. The only thing is you need an, uh, a special editor to benefit from it. Uh, and you have high level primitives. So by default in Mikkelsen, the integers are arbitrary lengths. Let me just talk a little bit about that choice. If you look at Solidity, for example, or the EVM, you're going to have 8-bit signed integers, 8-bit unsigned integers, 16-bit signed integers, 16-bit unsigned integers. You have the whole gamut of uh, integers of different lengths, signed or not signed. And there's not a whole lot of benefit from it. And the reason is you are not, you know, on smart contracts, you're not running really putting folding, right? You're running very, very simple business logic in 99% of the cases. Maybe you're running cryptographic primitives, right? But in that case, you can have them as high-level constructs directly available in a language. You're not looking to do C programming. So it's much I would much rather pay a very, very small cost. Like in the unlikely case where you said, well, you know what? I only deal with integers smaller than 256. So why should I pay for the overhead of having arbitrary length integers? And when I say pay, it's because you know, like in Ethereum, until you're paying some gas, like you're paying transaction costs in order for these contracts to execute. So why should I pay for arbitrary data integers? Well, because it's almost, it's almost the same. The gain, the gain that you would have from having like this uh, smaller atomic types is minimal, but the benefit of never having to worry whether or not you know, you're gonna overflow or you're gonna have uh, an error because your integer will be too big, is very, very nice. And so that's a nice and same default to have <coughs> if you're programming something that's going to do business logic as opposed to, you know, be a systems language. <clears throat> Other constructs, you have maps. You have uh, arbitrary association, associative maps. We have sets. You have lambda expression. <coughs> you can pass lambda expression between contracts. You can store them and execute them. So that gives you a lot of flexibility into what you can construct. You also have cryptographic primitives, like hash function, uh, verifying signatures. So you don't really need all this low level, uh, very low level um, integers because you can build all of that directly. But now what happens if we're missing a cryptographic primitive? Well, you know, one argument would say, ah, if you're missing something, then you need a very efficient assembly-like language so you can implement it. Not really, because we have a protocol that can be upgraded every three months. And so if there's a really important cryptographic primitive that everyone would want to use, for example, you want to have pairing cryptography. You want to be able to do uh, pairing on elliptic curves. You're not, not, you're not going to implement that in Nicholson. You're going to implement that as a library to Tezos and propose a protocol change. Uh, or propose it as part of a protocol change. So since we have an easy way in upgrading the type of primitives which are available, you don't really need this very low level language. A little bit about the call semantic for uh, Mikkelsen contracts. So calls to other contracts are not function calls. That's one of the big, well, big, big difference with Ethereum. If you're in Ethereum and I'm in the middle of executing a contract and I call another contract, that's a function <laughs> call. So my current control is going to be put in a stack, and then I'm going to put a new piece of code in the stack. I'm going to jump there. I'm going to start executing code. And when I'm done, I'm going to jump back to my execution point inside my contract. So that's, you know, that's nice when you're um, just writing function and trying to compute some things. But we're not doing it. And, and the nice part about not doing this is that you don't have DAO style reentrancy bugs. All the reentrancy bugs that you see in Ethereum are basi basically stem from this behavior of jumping out of context. In, in, in Mikkelsen, you basically have to say, I am done, I have updated my storage, I have done everything that I needed to do for my with my contract, and now that I am done, let me, let me send messages to the other uh, smart contracts telling them that I'm done. So does that mean that um, I can't do as much? No, you can do as much. So function calls uh, can be emulated using callbacks. So you, you can do the same thing. Uh, the trick is called continuation passing style, where basically your message to the other contract might be, well, I computed something, but I'm not completely done. I would like some information from you. So here's some information. Please call me back with that information. So you can implement callbacks. It's more cumbersome, but it's also, <coughs> it's also less common than you, than you think that you might need to call um, 
uh, that, you, that, that you might need to, to call these callbacks. Um, one technical thing to know is that the operation that you return, you return a list of operation, they're not placed in a stack, they're placed in a queue. Uh, so basically they're, they're executed in order and if you add more operations, you know, if I call you, uh, contract A sends a message to contract B and then contract B sends a message to contract C, that's not going to be executed until all of the messages which were created by contract A are executed. So um, it's not, um, it is, it is f first in first out and not uh, last in first out. So um, that's a particularity. It's still deterministic in a sense that when I send an operation, I know everything that's going to be called and in, what, and in what order, which is nice. However, for building sharding models, so you know, maybe looking in the future, if there are several chains that need to communicate, this model is very, very close to an asynchronous model of what you would expect if you didn't have this atomicity. So it's much easier to extend this model to a multi-chain, charted chain uh, paradigm than, than to extend the function call paradigm to that. Because you can say, because you already have this callback, you know, like I'm sending you a message, I'm not sure you're gonna get this message, maybe you'll give me a callback. That's what you need to do in a charted environment anyway. So I think it's good to have this as a default mechanism. Uh, and if one operation fails, you know, the entire thing uh, currently fails, so that you can rely on the uh, atomicity of execution. But again, that might change if you're looking at a shorter scenario. Let me tell you. Yeah. Me, can I just clarify? Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah. A, 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 a possible ambiguity with your accent. Oh, um, sorry. Are you meaning shared or shard, like S H A R D? Shard, like a, like like the building. Like, like in a database. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the Ethereum folks and other folks are making a, a you know a really really big deal about sharding, uh, about like you say like in a database, but instead of having one chain having many chains, and having those chains communicate. But the, the, the theoretical idea is the following: if you have a blockchain like Bitcoin, like Tezos, or like Ethereum today, uh, basically all the nodes in the network validate all the transactions and contain all the states. So if I'm running a node, I'm going to see every block, I'm going to see the content of every transaction. And so basically, if you double the number of nodes, you don't really double the number of uh, computing power that's available because everyone is redoing the same amount of work. So that limits the, the kind of throughput you can have. <coughs> so famously in, uh, you know, in Bitcoin, it, it, it's really actually hard to come up with, to, to, to find a, a hard number on this. Uh, but it, it goes anywhere from people are saying like four transactions per second to 10 transactions per second. I think Ethereum is about maybe twice that. I think Tezos is maybe twice Ethereum. And so that kind of limits how much you can do because you're limited in the number of transactions per second. And there are several approaches uh, to that problem. So one approach is to say, well, it doesn't matter. Let's just have let's just do let's just have bigger computers. Uh, let's just do more work in our nodes. Have bigger blocks. So you have, for example, the fork of Bitcoin Cash was the idea of saying, yeah, let's have bigger work, bigger blocks, so we'll have more transactions per second. The downside of this approach is that as you put more computational burdens on your nodes, you can centralize the network because fewer people are able to participate in the validation of the network because people who are ge geographically close of hard or, or have larger operation uh, end up being at an advantage over others, you are creating a centralization pressure on the network. By the way, it's not just about the cost of equipment. Um, just do a quick aparte. In Bitcoin, for example, let's say I, I produce a block with transactions and then I send it on the network. Immediately, I can start working on the next block because I know the block that I just sent, so I can start working on the next block. But the other people, they need to download my block. They need to apply all the transactions in it. And it might seem that it's all about bandwidth, but actually just verifying signature takes a while. So I need to basically like parse this block, read the content, apply it, and then I can start looking for my own block. And because of that, even if I have a super fast computer, it doesn't matter. Because of that, there's a small advantage in mining toward the person who's just found a block. And the bigger the block, the more that advantage uh, becomes important, and that actually creates a limit on, uh, that, that actually is a source of centralization that's a lot more important and a lot more subtle that, oh, but people can't afford big computers. I, that's, not, that's not really the problem. <clears throat> um, 
So yeah, one way is to just like scale on chain, say like, you know what, let's just have a bigger chain. Or let's just centralize everything. So you have the approach of EOS, which is to say, we'll just have 25 validators, and then run this really high infrastructure, and you know, 25 is good enough for decentralization. That's, that's an approach. Uh, the other approach, which is uh, taken by Bitcoin, is to look at layer two solutions and say, well, we only need the blockchain for really high assurance scenarios where you want to do a settlement and you want to be really, really sure it happens and everyone in the world has value that it happens. But for stuff that's not really that important, we don't need to do that. You know, let's say I'm running a game on a chain and maybe I have some points or I'm running some sort of social media thing and their likes and so on and so forth. I don't, I, I don't need this. I, I don't need everyone in the world uh, on a permissions ledger to validate that. Maybe I need to validate some payments once in a while. And so the approaches that these are taken are for uh, Bitcoin, it's a lightning network. Um, in, uh, in Ethereum, you have commit chains, which have been uh, nicknamed uh, Plasma. There's also commit chains projects in, in, in Tezos, where you basically kind of create a chain where you're going to do all your stuff and it can be fairly centralized. But then people have an option to impose economic penalties on the main chain in case people deviate from the honest behavior. So you have kind of like this economic penalty games where you only use your main chain as a mechanism of adju adjudication if people cheat on, the, on side channels or on commit chains or on all of these um, other methods. So that's the uh, layer two scaling uh, approach. And the third approach to all of that uh, is sharding. And the idea of sharding is to say, well, what if, uh, what if the validators just validated part of the network? What if instead of validating everything, they just validated a fraction of the transactions uh, and had a fraction of the state, but somehow we still had the same security for the overall network. Um, there's people have proposed different schemes for doing this, maybe because you will draw your validators randomly and randomly they'll have to validate one part and then randomly another part. They are fairly complex schemes. And um, I think that Ethereum has really, really tied their proof of stake proposal to their sharding proposal, and as a result, I think it's delayed their move to proof of stake a great deal. They are interesting sharding proposals. I think it's a little early. I think there's a lot of mileage to be gained just by some moderate on-chain sca on scaling. I think it's completely fine. Um, I also think like layer two solutions can be very helpful. And then once you cross both of those bridges, I think you can cross the bridge of sharding. That's just personal opinion on the, on the matter. Uh, but anyways, so yes, I was referring to sharding like in, uh, in databases. And so if you are sharded and you have smart contracts, then, uh, then now you really need this asynchronous calling mechanism because, you know, like when, when I call another contract, it's not just something that happens in the computer. You know, this message sent to the contract, that's going to be a real message on the network. If I call a contract that's in a different shard, uh, you know, the, 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 the node is going to actually have to send a message on a peer-to-peer -peer network and maybe it's going to make it on the other shard. I don't know when. So you have this two-phase comets approach where you will know that it's been received. There's complexity around that. The general point is that if you start with an asynchronous uh, calling convention for your smart contracts, you're already in good shape if you want to move to charting. Um, this is a bit of a mishmash, but let me tell you a, bit, a little bit about big maps. Uh, so currently, all the uh, contract storage so you know, I mentioned that contracts have, a, uh, have a data attached to them. And one of the, one of the important differences is with Ethereum is that right now all your contract storage is deserialized when the contract is called. So you have these bits on disk, and instead of just having these low levels say like, hey, yeah, write, write in this part of the disk, we take the entire storage, deserialize it, verify the type, and get it to you. It's more type safe. Downside is it takes some time. You are going to have to pay gas every time you access the storage which means you can't have a huge storage. It's if you're just going to store a date, an integer, that type of information, who cares, that's not a lot. But if you want to store, if you want to create um, the equivalent, what they call an, an Ethereum, an ERC20 token, for example, you want to create, you want to represent a stock, you want to represent an asset, uh, you want to represent uh, a database of domain names. <coughs> you don't want to digitalize it every time someone wants to call it. And so for that, uh, there's a special type called the big map which is just a large hash table, which is lazily deserialized. So here, you're only going to pay the cost when you access an element of this map. And that basically covers pretty much the only use case for having a large storage, which is storing some kind of ledger. So it makes it very, very, uh, very easy to do that. 
But currently, you only have one big map of contract, and that has led to some really contrived implementations. Because if you fundamentally need to store two things, maybe you have two assets, or maybe uh, you have a list of requests, a list of uh, customers, and a list of providers, you can try to do a union type and hash it and put that in your big table. It leads to ugly code. And so fortunately, there's a proposal right now that's uh, submitted to a vote called Babylon, and it will let you have as many big maps as you want inside the system. There was a technical limitation before, it's gone, and that makes for um, easier code. How do you address or index within a big map? How do what? How do you like address or index within a big map? So it's uh, content addressed. So basically your big map is going to have a type. Maybe your big map is from strings to integers, or it could be from timestamps to uh, <coughs> strings. You'll pass it a value. Uh, at the end of the day, it's a hash table. Cool. Okay. Uh, another change uh, in Babylon that's interesting is multiple entry points. So currently, there is a single calling point for contract. I shouldn't call it a calling point because it's not exactly a function call. But you have a single parameter. It's like when I call a contract, it expects a very specific message. But sometimes, in many cases, your contract kind of like receives message from different people. It does different things. You know, let's say I represent my, my contract represents some sort of ledger. Sometimes I want to, you know, sometimes maybe I want to uh, destroy an asset. Sometimes I want to transfer an asset. Sometimes I want um, to do other things. And so for that you would want to have what we could call multiple entry points, multiple kind of messages that you're going to send. And of course, you can already do that because we have subtypes. So let's say you want to have two methods, method A and method B. Method A taking a parameter of type TA, and method B a parameter of type TB. You could have, so this is Mikkelsen. In Mikkelsen, you have a sum type with a keyword OR. So you have, well, my parameter is just either something of type TA or something of type TB. And here, what you see with the percentage, that's one of these annotations. So that's just like, right now, if you use a ledger today, you can create a contract like this. And this is just uh, documentation. It doesn't uh, really mean anything. It's just documentation. <coughs> but someone who calls you, what they will do is they will have to either pass A and tell you, I'm passing you the left branch, and this is A. Or they will have to pass B and say, I'm passing you the right branch, and this is B. And what you can do in Babylon is that, uh, we make these annotations meaningful, semantically meaningful, by allowing messages to contract to be tagged by a message. So instead of telling you, I am calling you, and I'm calling the left part here with type A, you can just say, I'm calling method A. And basically, even if I don't know where method A is, even if you have a, a whole tree of, uh, of ORs, the system will look for something tagged method A and say, like, yep, you have the right tag. So it basically introduces some form of polymorphism over the uh, over the parameter type, which lets you do whatever you uh, whatever you want to call. More changes to Mikkelsen. There's a better gas model, so the gas cost when the ledger was released were kind of overestimated, very conservative value. Uh, and someone at Nomadic Labs did a, uh, uh, did an analysis of and, and uh, of the actual running time for different operations. Uh, purification and closure of lambdas, so we have lambda expressions that can now be partially applied and they can capture some of the parameters. <coughs> there are cheaper gas costs if you need to access elements deep in the stack, which is very useful if you want to uh, build a higher level language that compiles to Mikkelsen. We have comparable product types that you can use in your map. So there's a whole set of little changes to Mikkelsen, uh, which if you have programmed in Mikkelsen or if you've tried to build languages on top of Mikkelsen, uh, are pretty cool. I actually ended up taking longer than I thought, so I want to uh, give the floor to, uh, to Ligo, and then maybe do questions together afterwards. Yeah. All right, thank you.